Good Monday morning. I hope you're having a great day in the Lord. It is um, our time to get into God's Word. We're in the letter to the Romans. We're in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. So if you haven't already read Romans chapter 7, stop and read Romans 7. Keep this in mind. There is the first two and a half chapters of this book are stating very clearly that every person has the same problem. The problem is not what we do. The problem is who we are. We're born separated from God. Now, it's very important that we understand that because chapter one describes people who, through this broken nature, do really wicked things. They're separated from God. They need eternal salvation. But then you get to chapter 2, and it's really this idea that, that people that try to, maybe they're not out doing wicked, immoral things. They're trying to do good things, but they're still doing it in the power of their old, wicked nature. And so we find that both the people who are morally wicked and the people who are morally good, but all of it in the flesh are all in the same boat. There's none that does good. There's not even one. So we come to the we come to chapter three, verse twenty-one, where he starts to talk about, hey, there's a big change. Justification is what the immoral person needs and the moral person needs. Everybody needs to change. Not a change that we can make, a change that only God can bring about. It's not reformation. It's not trying to do better. It's regeneration. I don't need to try harder. I need to be born again. So when I'm born again, uh, both the immorality and the morality is going to change. So we went through all the way through chapter 4, the end of chapter 3, all of chapter 4 and chapter 5, talking about justification. Justification is the moment that God has revealed my broken nature before him. He has he is revealed to me that the only solution to my sinfulness is Jesus' substitution, his death, burial, resurrection. Somehow God made this alive to me. Has he made this alive to you? And at that moment, those two facts, my sinfulness and God's solution, became real and I surrendered. I gave up. This isn't a work that we do. It's quite the opposite of work. I have to give up my immorality, my wickedness, like chapter 1 talks about. But I also have to surrender my supposed goodness. Chapter 2. And I have to say, I am an enemy of God. I give up. And when I do this, God takes me from being a rebel against him, and he brings me, he justifies me, and brings me into his family. He places his spirit within me. Now, that's going to be a big change. So that's what we've talked about in end of chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. When we get into chapter 6, he's now bringing us into, now that I'm in God's family, now what? What does this look like? Things are going to change. If I'm now in God's family, what's going to start happening is he's going to discipline me like a loving father. If you want to learn more about that description, if you go to Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about every child of God that God receives, he's going to discipline. We call this process sanctification. So justification, my position changes. But now that I'm in a relationship with God, my practice about sin has to change. It's called sanctification. Justification is a point in time. Sanctification is a process. The process starts the moment that I'm justified. It ends the moment I physically die or the rapture happens, which at that moment will start eternity, what we call glorification. I will lose my sinful body and I will gain a glorified body that 
righteousness dwells in and it will be me getting to know God for all of eternity without having to deal with my sin. So right now in this sanctification process, I'm set apart for God. I'm righteous in Christ, yet I'm having to deal with my sin. There's no condemnation. We're going to see that in chapter 8 of Romans. But for now, I'm having to deal with my sinful flesh. You say, well, why has God allowed that? Great question. But here's the thing. God is allowing evil right now in this earth so that mercy can be extended. So why would he leave me here as a Christian? Well, as I go through this process of dealing with my sin before God, what we've been calling CCR, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, my own confession of sin, my own daily repentance of sin, is a testament, a testimony, a witness to the lost world that there's something different about me. And then God uses this witness to draw people to himself so that he can make them part of his kingdom also. So as difficult as it is right now to walk by faith in sanctification, the glorious part of it right now is that now is the only time that you and I will be able to be involved in making disciples God's work of building a kingdom. So as we get to chapter 6, chapter 6 was all about our old sinful nature. Even though we've been born again, even though we've been justified, it's always trying to enslave us, always trying to bring us down. So I want you to think about chapter 6 being the war with the flesh, and chapter 7 is the war of the flesh. However, Chapter 6 corresponds more with chapter 1, the really wicked things my flesh does. Whereas chapter 7 is all the good things my flesh tries to do. Neither one of them can ever please God. My human flesh, my sinful actions um, can never please God. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, you still have an old fleshly nature. And I don't care how much your new nature grows, it's still at war with your old nature. This is the, the struggle of sanctification. Glorification is going to be great because my old sinful nature that's wrapped up in this body is going to be taken away. But for right now, I'm struggling with it. And I think initially, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we struggle with the immoral things, chapter 6. But as we grow in the Lord, we should not be uh, actively rebelling against God any longer. So sometimes when we are not actively rebelling against God, we start thinking that, you know, we're pretty good people. We start to feel like we don't have to commune with God as much. We don't have to be in God's Word as much because, you know, we know how this is. I think uh, the greatest example of this is people that go to seminary, right? So you feel like you've sacrificed uh, the direction of your life to prepare to help other people grow. And in it, when you get there, you finally just backslide yourself. That's chapter 7. Can I, once I'm justified, how do I continue to grow in my relationship with the Lord? Uh, do I just try harder? I mean, I think that this is the, the tragedy of the church today is that people have surrendered their life to the Lord in justification. Maybe they come forward in a worship service and the pastor says, hey, it's great, come tonight and be baptized. So you come that, that night and you're baptized, a picture of justification, buried as Christ was buried, raised to walk in new life and everybody's excited. And then you leave and nobody explains to you or teaches you what does it look like to walk in new life. Well, first, God's going to be, you're going to be in God's Word, and God's Spirit's going to be dwelling in you. And God's Spirit first is going to show you all these outward rebellious things that you're doing, and you're going to confess those things as sin and repent of them, and you're going to get victory over them. 
But then the, the even more difficult part is the good that I try to do in my flesh. I have to confess that is sin. And it's ongoing because these are the things that I do that make me feel better than other people. But my, my worth and my being is not wrapped up in what I do. It's wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ and my relationship now with God the Father. But in order to continue that and to grow in that, it's going to have to humble me. So we're going to be talking a lot about that. So chapter 6 deals with getting rid of the rebellion outwardly in my life. Chapter 7 is going to be doing away with the inward uh, goodness that I think I can do on my own. And then chapter 8 is going to come in and share with us in a great detail about the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is going to do this. So let's pray and let's dive into Romans chapter 7. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. May it come alive to us on this Monday morning. May we be excited to be a part of what you're doing. Father, we thank you for this process of sanctification. We thank you for your patience and your kindness and your tolerance. But Father, may we ever be aware that these are for the purpose of our own repentance, first in justification, but then ongoing repentance and sanctification so that we can continue to grow and know you, but that also through that process, people will see our lives as different and they will want what we have. And it won't be, be good like us, it will be glorify God in this humbling process. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, uh, we begin chapter seven and he writes, or... So, he can, you know, it's got a hard uh, break here, but he's still talking about this sanctification process. Do you not know, brethren? So he's talking to believers, so he can't be talking about justification here. He says, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law. So he's saying, hey, the Jewish people, the people that I was talking to in chapter 2, now that they've been justified, do, now do I go back to... Uh, once I'm justified, do I go back to just trying to keep the rules? And the answer is clearly no. Okay, so he's going to really talk about sanctification and how the law corresponds. Okay, so if the law was for the purpose of bringing me to Christ, does the law have any good function for me after, after uh, justification? And the answer to that is yes. Okay, so as we look at it, he says this, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Okay, so the law has control over me or master over me as long as the law is alive and I'm alive. And then he gives us an example from verses 2 all the way to verse 3 of marriage. <laughs> and we've kind of lost this in our culture to our own detriment. But the law is this, that if I'm married to a woman, that I married this woman, and so we are married to each other as long as we both physically are alive. Now, if my wife dies, then I am freed from that marriage bond so that I can marry another woman if I wanted to, don't want to, but if I, if I married another woman at that point, then I would not be committing adultery. But if my wife is still alive and I go uh, be married or even have a physical relationship with another woman, it is adultery. But once my wife dies, I'm freed from that bond. Now he's using that as, as an example here. Get this. That when we're born, this is his connection, that we're born, married, or, or had the law has a master over us. Okay, we're under the law. What's God's purpose in this? Well, God's standard is the law, and I cannot keep that standard. So what the law produces in me is just bad stuff, right? No. We're going to get to this in a minute, but so if the law 
is, is showing me all these bad things in my life. How do I get free from it? Well, either the law has to die or I have to die. And clearly he's stating here that it's not the law that has to die. I've got to die. And so when I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ in justification, I died. And no longer does the law have control over me or jurisdiction or no longer I'm married to the law. I have died and I have been resurrected. Now I'm married to Christ. The law showed me that I can't, this is, this is bad. So I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I died. I was resurrected. Now to be married to Jesus. Now we're going to know more about what that part looks like in chapter 8. But let's follow his argument. Look at verse 4. Therefore, because this illustration of marriage, he says, my brethren, so he's again talking to believers, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. So that, so why did that all happen? You might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So if I am still married to the law, I cannot produce any fruit for God. Why? Because I never measure up. Remember? Remember what chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I can never bear fruit to God because I have fallen short. You say, well, how does justification help me falling short of the glory of God? Now, the, the very word justification means fixing this problem. Let me give you an example. Justification, if I'm building a, a deck on my house and I'm putting all the deck boards out and when I get to the end, all the boards are sticking out the other end and they're all different lengths. Well, I'm going to take a, a chalk line and pop a chalk line over those boards. And then I'm going to take my skill saw and I'm going to run them down those boards and I'm going to justify them. I'm going to make them all the same length. And so what justification means is that here's God's standard up here. Now, every one of us have been born fallen short of the glory of God, the standard of God. But in Christ, we're justified, meaning in Christ, I'm choom, brought up. It's imputed. It's not that something I did. Now I'm in Christ. Now, no longer do I need the law to show me my brokenness because I am well aware of my brokenness so much that I surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I died to the law so that now I could live for Christ. Now, this becomes a problem, right? Because even though I'm alive in Christ, my old sinful nature is still alive in my physical body. My body is used to controlling me, telling my soul what to do. But now I have this new nature in me, I'm trying to commune with God. And God's trying to control me, so they're button heads. Look what he says. He says, For while we were in the flesh... The sinful passions were aroused by the law, okay, uh, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death, okay? So as long as I'm married to the law, the rules, okay, it's, I, I can't measure up. The only thing I can do is try to manipulate the rules so somehow it made me look good. That's all of chapter 2. Or there's the people from chapter 1 who are just out actively rebelling against the law. But whether you're from chapter 1 or chapter 2, you cannot keep God's law. Remember what we learned in Galatians. If you break one aspect of the law, you're done. It's not as if God has a big scale up there saying if you do more good than bad, you're going to be all right. No, God says if you've ever done any bad, you're done. And not matter of fact, if anybody who you came from ever did bad. So you have to look back all the way to Adam. Guess what? We've got a problem. Okay, look what he says. He says, but, verse 6, now, now that you're justified, 
right? Now that you're justified, we have been released from the law. I died. I'm not trying to make myself look good. I've surrendered my life to the Lord. I'm released from the law having what? Died to that which we were bound so that we serve in newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. So what changed? Something massive has, has changed. In order for me to walk this new life, death has to occur. And death brings release from the law. Now remember, law is what continually shows me my guilt. But remember, Jesus Christ has taken away that guilt. So now, if I've been justified, I'm in Christ. And I'm living by a different uh, way. What's the new way? He calls it the newness of the spirit compared to the oldness of the letter. Do I live by rules any longer? The answer to that is no. I can't keep the rules. So what do I do? Now God places his spirit within me and I have a relationship with God where God now is changing me. Okay? Don't miss that point. The problem that we have is that we were born again by grace through faith. And then when nobody teaches us anything about it, we fall right back to the way our flesh operates. So now that I'm a Christian, now I just try to do the best that I can. So now that I'm justified, I'm still living by the rules. And, and the way we kind of do this is we set up rules to obey. And when we set up these rules, they're not to God's standards. They're, they're rules that we feel like we can attain to. And then we call it good living or good Christian living. Are you a good Christian? And we don't talk about sin because every time I talk about sin, it reminds me that I can't do this good Christian living. Um, and and we, we like to forget all about the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to get into the work of the Holy Spirit in this chapter. We're going to get into it tomorrow. But remember, the work of the Holy Spirit is conviction of sin, repentance of sin, and moving forward as God humbles us, then he produces this new man in us. Paul's argument in chapter 7 is, look, you can't do that in your own way. If you want to get to know God, you're not going to be able to just try to produce the new man in you by doing uh, good things, trying harder. You're going to have to deal with your sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let's keep going. He says, verse 7 starts this new section from 7 down to verse 13. is talking about the law, that the law reveals something about us. It reveals First, it shows us our sinful actions. That's what the law does. But even before there was law, the law is what shows us our sinful actions. But were there, so, were there problems even before the law came? Totally. Why? Because it's not about the actions. It's about my heart being separated from God. Now, as Christians, am I still a sinner? Do I still sin? And the answer to that is clearly, even though I've been justified, I'm not too glorified yet. Glorified, no more sin. So now I'm justified. I'm in this sanctification process. But the fact is that I still sin. And so I hear people say, well, God has forgiven you. He's taken away your sin as far as the east is from. The Bible teaches that that's going to happen at glorification. But in sanctification, I still sin. The difference between the believer and the unbeliever is not sin. Both still sin. The difference is the whole world is covering up their sin, trying to make themselves look good. Okay? They're deceiving themselves because the law is showing them that they're not good, but they're trying to manipulate it to make them look good. And the only way they can do that is hide. Now remember, the power of sin, the burden of sin is the hiding of sin. 
So in Christ, when I came to Christ, I died to the law by saying, I can't do this. It's not about me. I quit. I give up. God puts me in Christ. He puts his spirit within me. No longer am I trying to make myself look good. Now I'm trying to make Christ look good. What makes Christ look good? Not me covering up my sin, but me dealing with my sin openly and honestly, knowing by faith that the guilt is gone. We're going to read that in the first verse of our next chapter. Let's see this. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law bad? The law Okay, my relationship with the law, someone has to die. But remember, Paul's not saying that the law has to die. He's saying, I've got to die. If Now he says, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the law. He says, may it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know my, sinful, my sin except through the law. Remember, the law has a purpose. The purpose is, remember Galatians, it's our tutor. Try to take us by the hand and show us you can't do this on your own, that you need a savior. You don't need to just try harder to reform your life. You need to be born again. This is so awesome. Look what he says. I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin... Inside of me, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. Now, think about it. Did I have coveting in my life before the law? Yes. But when the law showed me my coveting, my coveting didn't get better. It got worse. Let's use a more simple example. Um, I'm not supposed to walk on the grass. There's a sign out there that says, don't walk on the grass. Well, maybe I never really wanted to walk on the grass, but as soon as I see a sign telling me, don't walk on the grass, what happens to me? Well, I've just seen the law. The standard there is don't walk on the grass. The authority doesn't want me to walk on the grass. So suddenly, guess what I want to do? Walk on the grass. So the law starts to reveal my heart. Now, just because I go walk on the grass doesn't change the fact that before I saw the sign, I still had the same heart. It just reveals that heart. So the law doesn't change our hearts. It just reveals them in a way we don't like. So what do we do? We try to change the law into something that's more palatable or easier to keep. Look what he says. He says, For apart from the law... Sin is dead. I wouldn't have known about sin unless the law showed my sinful actions and then guess where sinful actions come from. They don't come from the law. Remember, the law is not the bad thing here. The law is good. What's bad? Me. The problem's not the law. The problem is me. That's why I have to die. When I die to the law, that's when I say, I give up. I can't do this. I surrender to the Lordship of of Jesus Christ. I'm going to make him look good, not me look good. And then God justifies me. And then he puts me in this process of sanctification. Let's keep going. He says, verse nine, Paul writes, I was once alive apart from the law. Let's take that sentence. He's not saying that he was born again uh, before he got saved. What he's saying is before his time on the Damascus Road, when God uh, dealt with Paul. He was Saul at the moment. But when, before that, Paul knew the law. He was a Pharisee. He didn't learn any new information. But in the deception of the flesh, his marriage to the law was illegitimate because he tried to change the law into something that he felt like he was good. He felt like he was so good that he was going out helping other people keep the law. Matter of fact, when he was on the road to Damascus, where was he going? He was going to punish people that he thought were breaking the law. So he thought he was alive, but he thought he was keeping the law. But then on the Damascus road, God hit him with the true law. He took the blinders off his eyes and God says to him, it's hard for you to fight against me, isn't it? 
Well, that had to have been news to Saul and Paul because he thought he was serving God, but the whole time he was serving himself. And so the first thing that he says is, Lord, he surrenders control of his life. Now, if you're my Lord, did we see a change in his life after that? Oh, yes, we did. Read Philippians 3. He says all those things that before I used to think were good in my life, now they're just filthy rags. Now, he wasn't out doing terribly immoral things. He thought he was doing religious things. But they all came from the same heart, a heart separated from God. Look what he says. But when the commandment came, okay, on the Damascus Road, when God took the blinders off and showed that it wasn't just other people breaking the commands, but that it was him breaking the commands, it said, sin became alive He saw himself for the first time, and this is what I fear for many people who profess Christ and aren't really growing in their walk with the Lord. They have never really been justified because sin, their own sinfulness, has never come alive to them. They've never really come to the place of seeing themselves before God. And so then we carry on this idea that, you know, I know I do bad things, but I'm pretty good compared to most people. But remember, the standard is not most people. The standard isn't that I do more good things than bad things. The standard is the perfection of Jesus Christ. And if you can't measure up to that, the law says you're condemned to hell. But Christ comes in and says, I'm going to show you a new way. But in order to grab a hold of this new way, you must totally die to the old way. So I have surrendered my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm in this new way, but my old sinful nature is still there. It's not gone yet. And I don't care how much my new nature grows in Christ, my old nature has not changed one bit. My old nature still hates God. Now, before I was justified, I had to obey that old nature. But now in my new nature... I have no obligation, I have no force to obey my flesh. But here's what happens. It's kind of like my default mode. When I'm not focused on Christ, when I take a few days off, man, I'm right back to that. Look what he says. He says, "Um, But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved... To result in death for me. So what God did on the Damascus Road was he was promising him eternal life. I want to give you a relationship with Almighty God. But in order for that to happen, you must die. So the question for you and for me in this is, when I was justified, if I was justified, what died there? Did I die? Did I die to me making me look good? Or did I just think I was adding Christ to my life? Did I think I was just trying to get a little Jesus? Because know this, Christianity is not about adding a little bit of Jesus to your life, trying to go to church and trying to do better. This is a radical new life where God controls me and where Christ now is my life. Do I work a job? Yes. But in my job, what's my goal? To uh, glorify Christ. In my job, I meet other people. What is my goal in meeting other people? To love them. How am I going to love them the best? Introducing them to Christ. Let's keep going. He says this. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So, Think about this. When I was still married to the law, okay, the standard, the the law wasn't deceiving me. What then deceived me? My old sinful nature. How did it deceive me? It, it, It led me to think that I could somehow, through my own actions, do enough good to satisfy the law. And that's a total lie. That's what Paul tells us in Galatians. It's not that I have to keep more than I break. It's that I have to keep it all perfectly all the time. That's God's standard. Look what he says. He says, So then, 
The law is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The problem isn't with the law, the problem is me. What's the problem in me? My sin nature is the problem in me. Is that going to be a continual problem in me? Yes. However, before I was justified, I had, I was enslaved to it. I didn't have to obey it. But now that I'm in a new relationship, I'm walking in newness, the newness of the Spirit, all I have to do is follow the guidance of the Spirit. We're going to talk about more of what that looks like. But how does the Spirit work? The Spirit doesn't work by saying, now you go out and try harder tomorrow. The Spirit works through CCR. I'm in the Word. I'm learning about the character of God. The Spirit, as I'm reading the Word of God, starts convicting me of sin. Then I am going to confess my sin to God and to others, and I'm going to repent of my sin. Ongoing repentance in my life. As I do this, it humbles me. And when I'm humble, then God can come in and start to produce this fruit in me. This fruit that he talked about up here in verse uh, number five, where it says, in order that we might bear fruit for God. I can't just go out tomorrow and say, God, I'm here today. I want to bear fruit for you. We've got to go through God's process. And God's process is your job and my job is to put off the old man. Remember Colossians 3. Your job and my job is to put to death the old man. Process of CCR. As I do this, God humbles us. And as I'm humble, then God comes in and starts producing this new man in me. We can't just turn that around and say, okay, I think I would rather try hard to produce the new man and let God take care of getting rid of my sinful flesh. No. What does that produce? It, that produces what's called self-righteousness. Now, self-righteousness is not righteousness at all. That's the deception of sin. See, the deception of sin is that I change the standard so that to something that I think that I can keep. So self-righteousness uh, is really not righteousness at all. It's really what the Bible describes as the worst form of rebellion. Self-righteousness, the Bible states, is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Will not allow the Holy Spirit to work. The Holy Spirit's trying to show me that I'm a sinner, but I'm rejecting that. And he's saying, hey, if you or I will go on in self-righteousness, then there is no way that I can ever be saved. It's the sin that can never be pardoned blaspheming the Holy Spirit. If you want to be saved, if I want to be saved, it's going to be by coming. The law is good. I'm sinful. I have to die. I die. The law is good. But I die. When I'm resurrected in Christ, I'm born again. I'm born again into this new life. Not by the law, but now by the Spirit. The Spirit is going to be showing me sin and going to be giving me the pathway to have freedom out of that sin. Isn't that good news? Look what it says. It says this. Therefore, verse 13, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? No, may it never be. Rather, it was the sin. It, it's not, it, this, it, look what it says. It says it was sin in order that it might be shown to be what? Sin. So we have this thing about us that wants to not call sin Sin. Think about how crazy this is. What does God want from you and me? He does not want you to live a sinlessly perfect life. What he wants you to do is call your sin, sin. He doesn't want you to call it a little mistakes in your life. He doesn't want to call it character flaws. He doesn't want to call it a misstep. He doesn't want you to go apologize to people. What does he want you to do? He wants you to confess sin. He wants you to agree with him that what God says is right. I'm wrong. And God's saying, you can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, what Paul's saying is before he came to faith in Christ on the Damascus Road, he knew that there was a law. He was alive to the law. He saw everybody else's sin. But when he became alive, when he was born again, 
God started to show him his sin, how he has broken the law. We have a blindness to this in our own sinful flesh. Look what he says. He says, rather it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good. So the law showed me my brokenness before God to bring me to the point of saying, I surrender. I'm going to die to me so that I can live to Christ. Uh, so that through the commandment, what? Sin would become utterly sinful. I would start to see sin for what it really is. Is sin ever going to, it promises to lead me to happiness. Does it ever do that? Not in any lasting way. It says it's going to lead to life, does it? No, it just leads to death. That's the deception of it. So sin always takes me further than I want to go. It always costs me more than I want to pay. And it produces more uh, than what I sow. Um, so how bad is sin? Oh, only the Holy Spirit of God can show us. I was once blind, Paul says, but now I'm seeing. Uh, I'd known the law before, but I still thought I was good. But on the Damascus Road, God showed him that he wasn't good. The question I have is, have you ever come to the place where God has shown you your sin? If he has, then he's broken you in a good way broken you to not be deceiving yourselves anymore about your own strength and your own power to accomplish this yourself. You cannot do it. You cannot accomplish justification in your own flesh. You cannot accomplish sanctification in your own flesh. And you definitely cannot accomplish glorification in your own flesh. But God can accomplish all of that and you can be a willing participant. He initiates, we respond. Now, the, the, the law arouses our sin, and the law ruins the sinner, okay, to the point where we will surrender, okay? Now, here, now he's going to talk more about this struggle. Now that I'm justified, I have the Holy Spirit living within me, what do I do when I sin? Well, I got good news for you. It's hard. Look what he says. For we know that the law is spiritual, okay? The law is spiritual, meaning it's of the realm of God, spirit. But I'm born physically, spiritually what? Dead. But when I am in Christ, I'm now spiritually alive. It says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh. Now, what's he saying? He's saying, I have a spiritual nature and I have an old nature in me. He's not saying that I am totally of flesh like my body. He's saying the flesh is still alive in me. My, I have a new spiritual nature now. Okay, This spirit, this law of Christ that I'm under. right? But I still find that my old sinful fleshly nature is still there also. Remember, that won't be gone until glorification. Look what he says. My old sinful nature is sold into bondage to sin. My fleshly sinful nature, I'll say it again, is never going to grow and get better. It's never, even though my spiritual nature is growing and being renewed day by day and getting to know God, if I step back and start depending on my flesh and my own strength, I'm going to be right back in the wickedness of whatever. Uh, maybe you've seen this, somebody that you really look up to as being a spiritual person, and suddenly you, you hear about them committing adultery and totally destroying their family. And you think, how could that happen? Well, if you know Romans 7, clearly you know how it can happen. Can uh, Christians backslide and fall into sin totally how quickly can it happen quick the question is every day am i struggling to get to know god and that be guided by it if i'm being guided by my spirit i don't have to worry about being led by the flesh but as soon as i start taking breaks from this my spiritual walk with god abiding what we learned from john 15 abiding in the vine 
Because apart from the vine, guess what? I can't do anything of any good. So the moment that I quit growing in my walk with God, the moment that I quit, quit submitting to him, dealing with my own sin, I'm going to fall right back into being controlled by my lust of the flesh, my lust of the eyes, my boastful pride of life. And then I'm going to try to self-justify. I'm going to try to lower the standard of Jesus Christ, what we learn from 1 John chapter 2. He says this. Um, 4, verse 15. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I'm doing the very thing that I hate. See the, the struggle that he's in? I want to serve God. I want to do the right thing. But the doing of it doesn't seem to happen. That's why. What he's saying here, the process isn't wake up tomorrow and try harder to do better because you can't do it. The process is the process that God has given us, which is when I sin, not if, but when, Go through the process of confessing sin to God and to others, returning from that sin in repentance. And then through the pain of that and the humility that brings, is going to be, as you deal with the repercussions of your sin, you're going to start to see how serious it is. You're going to, have to, you're going to see the widespread filth of it to the people that are in contact with you. But through it, I hope you see from verse 15 how just this is not a try harder thing. I can't. I want to do the right thing, but it doesn't seem to happen. My natural inclination just when I react, it just it's the flesh. Look what he says in verse 16. But if I do the very thing that I don't want to do, I'm agreeing with the law, confessing that the law is good. This is confession and repentance. So when I sin... If I'm a child of God, I'm going to confess that I'm wrong. I'm not going to try to cover it up. I'm not going to try to sketch around because I know that those things are my flesh. If I'm in the spirit, I'm going to deal with these things openly and say, you know what? What I did, I hate as much as the law does. I hate this as much as God does. And if I hate it, why would I want to walk any longer in it? It's been said that, you know, when you're justified, when you're born again, just then go out and sin as much as you want. But the question is, how much as a child of God should you want to sin when you know what pain and destruction that has caused to God and what pain and destruction that has caused for God's creation and even in your own personal life? Why would you... Well, I mean, how much would it take for you to be filled with pain and misery? Unless maybe we don't yet have our eyes open to see the pain and misery of our own sin. And if that be true, then that means you have not been justified yet. If you've been justified, then God has awakened you to your own sin. And now the process of sanctification is him going through the practical daily life of dealing with it. Let's keep going. He says this. Verse 17. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. This isn't trying to make an excuse for sin. It's saying my spiritual nature that is led by the Holy Spirit is not in agreement with my old flesh. How do I prove that? When my old flesh rears its head by sinning, I stand up quick and confess that I'm not on board with what the flesh just did. If I cover it up, I'm saying, I, I'm siding with the flesh. What do you think it means when the Bible says you're saved by grace in Ephesians chapter 2 through faith? What is that faith? Well, in Romans chapter 1 verse 17, it says, this begins by faith at justification, but what's the faith look like in sanctification? It looks like me siding with the Spirit and the law over against trying to justify my old sinful flesh. It's confessing sin, turning from sin, not minimizing it. Look what it says in 18.4. I know something. Every Christian knows this. I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. So, when I lie, 
I, as a Christian, am aware that that lie did not come from the Spirit of God. It didn't come from God guiding me. So if it didn't come from God guiding me, where did it come from? It came from my flesh. Now, I should not be surprised about the wickedness of my flesh. So if I'm not surprised about the wickedness of my flesh, and I'm not trying to make myself look good in front of you, then I will confess my sin quickly, I will repent of that sin, and I will walk forward magnifying in Christ. The whole process then magnifies Christ. I'm confessing Jesus as my Lord. However, if when I'm confronted with my lie, I said, no, who do you think you are talking to me? You're a liar too. Well, yes, we're all liars. But the question is, are you a liar that is coming into the light? John 3, uh, 21 or John 3, 19 through 20. Are you a sinner who is trying to hide because they're afraid of punishment? You and I, folks, don't have to be, in Christ, don't have to be afraid of punishment. Now, God will discipline us to help us mature as fully dependent believers on him who are carrying out his will and his kingdom and his righteousness. He'll not put up with sin. Let's keep going. He says this, verse 19, For the good that I want to do, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. This, if you're a growing Christian, you know what this is. Remember, evil is anything not led by God. So I'm in this, I, I, would, I was born just doing what I want and doing what I think. I was my own authority, right? But when I got saved, now I'm in this relationship with God where He's given me his word and his spirit, and I'm trying to grow and be led by him. But things will happen, and when things happen, I react to them, and I respond. And How, how do I respond? You know, maybe my wife says something to me that uh, I feel disrespected, and at the moment I feel disrespected, I get angry and I lash out at her. Well, is that Christ when I lash out against her? No, what is that? My flesh. Do I love my wife? Yes. Do I want to lash out at her? No. Then why is I, the, the very thing that I don't want to do, why is that what I'm doing? That's what Paul's describing. And he says, I practice the very evil that I do not want. But, verse 20, if I am doing the very thing that I don't want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Now, some people have taken this to say, oh, okay, that means I don't, as a Christian now, I don't ever have to deal with my sin because I don't want that, but I still do it. Okay, so the problem with that is the world, you're just covering up your sin, trying to make yourself look good. Okay, this is the idea of, okay, so if I'm out sinning, but I don't want to sin, then there's conflict right within me. So who am I going to side with? If I cover up my sin, I'm siding with my flesh. If I side with the Spirit of God that lives in me, I'm going to come out. I'm going to confess my sin openly before God, before other people. If someone, I remember being in a church uh, business meeting where someone stood up and they as the pastor, I was moderating the meeting and they said, you're a liar. Well, of course, when somebody stands up and says, you're a liar, in that particular moment, I was not lying. But was what they were saying true? Am I a liar? Well, if, if I'm aware of my sinful flesh, then I know what? I know I'm a liar. And so it was interesting at that moment to agree and say, well, of course I'm a liar. Are you trying to say that you're not? Um, and, and just to be honest with, all of us have a sinful uh, nature. And if I give into that sinful nature, it's going to go according to the flesh. This is what Paul's writing in Galatians 6 where he says, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. But if you sow to the spirit, you're going to reap life eternal. You're going to get to know God. That's what he's talking about here. And it's awesome. He's not giving himself a pass about his sin, saying, I know my body's sinning. This isn't uh, the body's bad and the spirit's good. 
It's I'm going to agree with God and I'm going to discipline my body to bring it under submission rather than my body controlling me. How do I do that? Through confession and repentance. Look what he says in verse 21. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. So he's saying, I'm justified, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm walking, I want to please my heavenly Father. But here's what I find. Me, the one who wants to get to know God, I find that in me, there is part of me that wants to go off on my own and be directed by myself. So there's a war right within me. He says, verse 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. Not the law outward rules, but the law which he's called the newness of the spirit. All of chapter 8, he's going to be describing this. So he says, I joyfully, I'm content to agree with God working inside of me. And he says, but I see a different law in the members of my body. What in verse 14 he told the flesh, my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. So here are the two sides. I've got the law of sin and I've got the law of my mind, which is renewing my mind with the truth of Christ. I want to, I want in my mind to be directed by God, but I get in moments where I respond and I react and it's the flesh. And he says, verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? I want you to see this vivid picture right here. In Tarsus, where Paul was from, there was a, a way, kind of a unique way in Tarsus, where if I murdered someone, um, I would get direct uh, lex talionis, I would, eye for an eye, right? So I would lose my life. Now their way of executing me would be to take the dead body of the person that I kill and take me and match me and the dead body up face to face and tie me together with the corpse. And tie me together in such a way where I cannot be free from this corpse. Well, what would happen? Uh, the rigor mortis of the one corpse would come into the second corpse and would kill the second corpse. And so what he's saying, he's using this illustration here to picture himself and any person uh, who is born again. We've got this new nature and this old nature and they're tied together. How can I break free so that the death of my old nature doesn't impact my new life? That's the picture. And I'm glad he doesn't end right there because that's a pretty sore picture. Oh, wretched man that I am. If you are a Christian and you're going through this process of dealing with you, at, there are moments when you are so humbled and you feel so powerless that you feel like, I can't do this. I remember a, a specific time in my life where um, I lashed out in anger against my wife for no reason. And through coming back to her and getting reconciled with her and confessing my sin to her, I said this. I said, Sean, I don't think, I don't think I'm ever going to change. And she said something that rocked my world. She didn't say, well, if you don't change, I'm leaving. She didn't say, I'm done with you. All she said was, I don't know either. I'm still in this with you, but I don't see how this can change. And God used that moment to show me that I can't change you. All I can do is keep confessing my sin. And from it, God humbles me. And through that, then he starts to produce love in me, joy in me, patience and kindness, self-control. God does that as I do my part. My part of putting to death the old man, he comes in and forms the new man. Verse 25 gives us hope. Thanks be to God through what? 
Jesus Christ our Lord. Are we supposed to confess Jesus as Lord? Yes. How do I confess Jesus as Lord? We're going to talk more about this as we go through Romans, but it's the process of CCR. It's God's standard, His Lordship, not my standard and my Lordship. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other, my flesh, the law of sin. So he's being honest. There is a war going on within the believer. How do I win this war? It's not by trying harder tomorrow to do this myself. It's by coming at it God's way through the process of CCR. We'll talk about that more tomorrow as we dive into Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Whoo! Oh, it's exciting. So let's pray and let's uh, go out in our day and let's serve the Lord together. So would you bow with me? Father God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the law that has shown us our brokenness. Father, help us to put to death our old nature. Help us, Father, to deal with our own immorality before you and confess it as sin. But, Father, help us to also deal with our own morality before you, our self-righteousness. Help us to kill it and know that we can't, do, uh, we can't even do good in our own flesh. So, Father, we need to be directed by you. So you direct us today. You help us to be about your will and your way. And may we be willing to participants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you have a great day. Peace.